I DM'd him. I was like, hey, listen, like, give me a fight. I'll fight anybody. And I was absolutely hammered. And then I woke up in the morning and he responded. He was like, all right, yeah, I'll see what I could do, whatever. And I just, like, went along with it. They gave me an opponent. And the fight was scheduled for two days after I got out of the room. Nothing like stars from a paradise. Don't care because there's magic in the air tonight. Pretty girl in my ear, she the rarest type. Heaven on earth is right here tonight. I'm in the dream state. I'm in the dream state. In all time history, there is no other way. The Red Cast, we are in the most well-protected vicinity in the greatest state in the Union right now. And you're going to know why in a minute when I introduce this guy. He's an absolute animal. We should have been recording the whole last hour. I mean, we were podcasting the whole time. I can't wait for this conversation. We have the legend, Eric Nighttime Nolan. How are we doing, brother? I'm good. Thanks for having me. This I'm is uh, for this. Oh, this, this is, is amazing. This is going to be fun. This is going to be a good one. Like I said, the whole last hour, we were, as Joe DeFeo said, we were podcasting before we were podcasting, yeah. before the cameras were live. So um, I guess where I want to start, um, and we've been going, as I said, but our connection uh, goes back a little bit, which I didn't even realize. But you told me recently at the Mecca DJs, of course. And one and only DJ. <laughs> the one and only. And... You have actually been to Reds, correct? Absolutely. So so you're friends with DeCastro and all those guys? Yes. Hometown friends. We played baseball together our whole lives. Um, and then I was home from the Marine Corps, just turned 21, and I was like one of the first bars I went to when I was 21. Was Reds? Was Reds. Let's was go. Reds. That's fire. Yeah, because so this actually goes back to, to I guess, early, early 2020 because that's when they started playing – Reds was on dollar drink nights, I believe, yes, right? Yes. On Friday nights. And I remember I, I popped through uh I popped through just to like support them, like just see how it was and I had a great time. Oh, dude, that was got a little buzzed up, but <laughs> I had a good time. You know, those guys and it, it's cool that that connection comes around because those guys are awesome. Like really good just good people through and through. I love them. I told you I FaceTimed to Castro yesterday. I was like, yo, Nolan's coming out tomorrow. We're going to be fucking ripping it. And uh, he told me he's joining the fire department and all that. He's in the school now. So uh, just through and through good guys. And it was interesting to hear that because I didn't even realize. Um, so you had just gotten back from the Marines at that time. Yes. I was like visiting. I was like almost done with the Marine Corps, but I was visiting and I was 21. So I was like, let's send it. You there know? was no other place to send other than Reds at that time, because it was Dollar Drink Fridays. The place was going crazy. That was right before they shut everything down. Yeah. So that was right before. So we got a little bit of a send-in. It sucked at that time because it just started to take off, actually, you know? And I started to meet a lot of good people, like DeCastro and all those guys, Marzano. They would always come in. Um, and then it, everything got shut down. And so that summer was like... I actually stayed in contact with them throughout the summer. It was funny. We, you know... At that time, everything was shut down, so you had group chats going on, like video chats, and they knew my buddy Dan Valerio. So we had this whole crew of people that I met from Reds, like the cash room and all those guys, and then uh, a couple of my friends from home, and we would pretty much FaceTime every single day. We'd have a massive group chat, and that kind of kept us going. Um, so uh, let's just start with the Marine Corps, because that's where you know our connection kind of started, was near the end of your reign in that. What made you decide to go to the Marine Corps when you first joined? Um, it's something that you know, throughout middle, in middle school, high school, like all I wanted to do was join the Marines. My grandfather was a Marine. Uh, no one else in my family was a Marine, but just him. And, uh, I told myself like throughout school, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to go to the Marines. Uh, I want to get out and I want to start fighting. Like that's like what I wanted to do ever since I was in like middle school. So it's kind of cool. I stuck to that game plan for so long. Um, it's been a long journey, but yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to join the Marines. Damn, so you want, you knew that that was what you wanted to do. A hundred percent. I was never the best student, at, like, I'm going to be <laughs> honest, because I knew, like, that's what I wanted to do. I was like, Marine Corps doesn't care about your grades. Like, I'm just going to do it anyway. How many other people in the Marine Corps did you come across that were, you know, on that same mindset? Did you meet a lot of people that were like, yeah, I've always wanted to do this? Or was a lot of people just joined, you know, because that's what they felt like they wanted to do? You get, a, you get both. Um, so, like... I, I was an infantryman. I was a grunt. So you get more people that really want to do it that become, like, infantry. Like, that's what they want to do. And then on the other side of it, you get a lot of people that they don't really know what they want to do yet. 
and they decide to join the Marine Corps, um, you know, I always tell people like that. I'm like, why don't you just like join the Army? It's a lot easier in in, in certain aspects. The Marine Corps is like highest level of just joining the military you could do. Um, but you get both of it. You get people that like also they join it and they really hate it and they don't want to be there anymore. But you got to do the four years. You sign a contract. You got to finish the contract. So it's 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 interesting to see like the kind of people you'll meet there. Like you'll meet people from all across the country. Um, people in there that are just trying to get their citizenships. Like it's it's definitely a weird environment to put yourself in, especially like right after high school. Like I was seventeen. When yeah, mentally, the Marine Corps, I know, is extremely trying. Like, it, it puts you through the ringer. And one of my good friends, one of my best friends, actually, he joined right out of high school as well. But maybe like a year out of high school, we were all going to college and doing our thing, and he decided he wanted to go. Um, now, when he, when he initially joined, I don't know if he was thinking about making it a career, but as of right now, he's still in the Marine Corps. He re-enlisted twice. Um, when you joined, were you planning on making it a career or were you just joining and saying, I'm going to do this first four years and then see where I'm at after that? Exactly. I was just doing the first four to see where I'm at. Um, I did love the Marine Corps. I, like a lot of some people, they join and like, ah, oh, like, thank God I'm getting out, whatever. It was never like that for me. Um, I had a very good four years. I was surrounded by really good leaders. Um, I had a lot of opportunities inside the Marine Corps to just excel as a human being like very rapidly. And the maturity that it just gives you is just second to none. So, yeah, I had I had the really good four years, and that's what I would like. But near the end of it, I was like, you know what? Like, it's not that this isn't for me. It's just there's so much more outside of the Marine Corps that I want to accomplish for myself. And the whole mindset was, is, look, I gave four years to my country. Uh, now I could focus on myself and worry about me. And when did you start? So, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, you're you're fighting. I mean, you're you're just you're in the CFFC. It yep. is CFFC. And is that under the UFC or no? So it's like a, I I always compare it to like uh, like football. Like CFFC is like a regional promotion. So think about it as like college football, and then the UFC is like the NFL. Okay. Like. Because they show it on Fight Pass, correct? Yes, UFC Fight Pass. So when you were nearing the end of the Marines, was the plan to go into fighting after that? Have you have you been into uh, MMA like your whole life? I wrestled my whole life. Okay. Um, I wasn't I wasn't really hooked into MMA until I was in high school and in the Marine Corps on a Saturday night when there's a big fight card, everybody just goes to the nearest Buffalo Wild Wings, pays the twenty bucks, and watches fights. And I remember I was sitting there and I was like, dude, I could do shit like and uh five beers in six beers in turned into 10 and that turned into <laughs> that <laughs> this is funny yeah. that turned into me dming a promoter that was had like a promotion down by where i was in uh quantico and i wasn't training at an mma gym i was just i was actually a martial arts instructor in the marine corps that's what i was doing i dm'd him i was like hey listen like give me a fight i'll fight anybody and i was absolutely hammered and then I woke up in the morning and he responded. He was like, all right, yeah, I'll see what I could do, whatever. And I just, like, went along with it. They gave me an opponent, and the fight was scheduled for two days after I got out of the Marine Corps. So I was able to do it. And all I was doing was running, swimming, hitting a heavy bag, and wrestling with a couple other Marines. And I fought this Muay Thai dude that actually trained MMA. And it went very well for me. So thank God. So but, you had you were not training any other like part of mixed martial arts except for you had the wrestling experience and you were just training the rest of what you just said. No MMA training went into this fight. Not a single, not a single second spent in an MMA gym. What was that like when you were walking into the octagon? Well, I tell people this all the time because like my mindset now is completely different than what it was in the Marine Corps. When I was in the Marine Corps, I really didn't give a shit about anything. What happened to me? Nothing. I was just like. <laughs> I was like, who am I fighting? This guy? All right, cool. Yeah. And, like, I had a, another Marine that was a professional fighter, and he, he like, helped coach me through it. And he was like, dude, just stick to your freaking wrestling, bro, because your hands are <laughs> sus. And I was like, <laughs> and I remember, like, I got in there. He threw a kick right off the rip. I just took him down, and I just kept taking him down, taking him down. And thank God my cardio was just absolutely nuts because – if I tried doing that shit now against somebody 
more high level, I'd get smoked. But, um, yeah, dude, that was ab- I was out of my mind. Like, I think about it now, and I'm like, <laughs> I think about it now, and I'm like, yo, like that could have went very bad for me. Yeah, I mean, that there's there's one or two. I mean, someone's gonna win, someone's gonna lose, and it's crazy. I think also that you just in general have a great mindset uh, mindset about you, like your mental the way you're focused about things. And I see it at DJs too when you're working. I can see you're laser focused. And just from talking to you, I get that. So I can only imagine being in the Marines, how much that solidified that. And then you go into this fight, no experience. You just DM this promoter and he gets back to you. And he's like, let's fucking run it. And you go in there and you got the win. Yeah. And back to what we were saying about like such like a small world. So the fight promotion was called Cowboy Fight Series. It was ran by Donald Cerrone. So like he was ringside watching my fight. No shit. Yeah. Legend. And, and one of the uh, one of the announcers was the guy that I train with now, Carl Roberson, who's a, who's a UFC fighter. Um, and I remember when I moved back to Jersey, I went to the gym I train at now full time, and I saw him there, and I was like, "Yo, do you remember me? Like, you announced my fight." And he goes, "Yeah, I fucking know you." Like, <laughs> and then uh, and fast forward to now, like I train with him pretty much like four times a week helping me tremendously so yeah he's had a good career um i know about him as well um so after that fight were you already planning to continue fighting or you won that fight and then you're like yo i'm gonna go full force on this oh no i was regardless i was probably gonna just commit my life to it because it's just something i set myself like this is what i wanted to do um and it's it's a it's something that like a lot of the marines i was like working with like they were like dude you're like really passionate about this like that's what you should get out and do, like, 100%. So, yeah, that was my whole mindset based on, like, starting off. And, like, it's, I already told myself, I'm taking this as high as I could go, and if I crash and burn, like, whatever. So you already committed. You're like, I'm doing this. I think that's yeah. the best way. I think you got to go all or nothing. Yeah. I think you just got to go for it 100%. And I've seen that in multiple things, especially with Reds. That It was like, that was what I was doing, my main focus. There was a lot of other things going on, and I was like, no, 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 I'm going to focus on Reds. I'm going to make sure this works. And it took off, and it was because I went all in on it, and I think that's the best way to go about it. All right, quick interruption from the pod to talk about our first ever sponsor of the Redcast, Komodi. Now, if you've been tuning into the Redcast, you know I am the inventor of the white tee shot. If you were a sender of the Reds' golden era, you know how many white tee and green tee shots we served. If you have sent with me during the summertime, you know how many white tee and green tee shots I like to order. 20, 30, 50, 100. You name it, we've done the number. And when you're ordering that many shots or serving that many, it's going to take some time. Komodi figured it out. Green tee, white tee, in the bottle, ready to go. So with the holidays coming up, Thanksgiving Eve, Christmas, New Year's, you know, have family and friends over all the time. You're going to need that perfect shot for everybody. Komodi is it. You can check out where they have it available at Komodi.com under the Where to Buy tab. I'll have the link in the description. I'll also have the link to their episode of the Redcast in the description. So if you want to learn more about them, you can. Huge thanks to Komodi for sponsoring the pod. Let's get back into it. And remember, you got to be 21 years or older to buy or drink alcohol. If you're going to drink it, drink responsibly. So after that fight... You start training. Where do you start with the training? Like now, obviously, you said before that, no MMA training. What was the first step after that fight? So, side side note on this. Like, I promised my mom that I would go to school because the military was going to pay for it. So, I had to do school on top of that. And training full-time MMA in an actual MMA gym was, like, mind-boggling to me. I was like, what is it? Like... You're training jujitsu, you're training kickboxing, you're training boxing, you're training wrestling, you're training all these different martial arts, and it's kind of hard to, like, master, like, any of them, let alone when you're focusing on five different martial arts. Um, yeah, so it it definitely opened my eyes, like, starting to train MMA full-time because, like I said, my first fight, I was just hitting the heavy bad bag, doing Rocky workouts and shit, and, like, just hopped in there. And I realized really quick, like, what professional MMA is. And even as an amateur, because you start off on the amateur scene, even as an amateur, I always trained like a professional. So when I made that jump into the professional level, it was nothing new to me. Because there is a difference between an amateur level fighter and a professional level level fighter and the way they train. I think a lot of people think from the outside that fighting is like 
there there may not be that difference in the levels, but there it, it goes really deep. So how many fights did you fight amateur before moving to the pro level? I fought six amateur fights within, like, my first year of MMA, I fought, first eight months of MMA, I fought four times. Like, I just jumped right into them, boom, 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 boom. And then COVID hit, so it's paused me. Nobody, no amateur level guy was fighting for, like, a year and a half. And then I just, I got two more quick amateur fights and then turned pro. And so training for that, doing that, all while going to school. Yeah. The school, balance was tough or what? School full time. So I'll, I tell people my schedule and they're like, what, what is wrong with you? Like, why do you do this <laughs> to yourself? So I'd wake up in the morning and I'd go, go to drive 30 minutes to my gym, train for like an hour, drive all the way back, shower, eat real quick, then sit in classes for like two hours, three hours, go lift in between that go back to class for another, like, two or three hours, and then back to MMA training at night, the actual, like, legit team practices, wake up, do it all over again. Like, and, then, and then add bouncing the DJs now to the mix. It's yeah. like, holy well, that, God. The, the DJ, that's a summer thing. So it's, it's actually, I like it a lot better because I could just wake up, train in the morning, eat, chill out, lift, go sit in the sun, go train at night, and then DJs. Um weekends the weekends are rough though bouncing until like three in the morning and then waking up and having to go train at like eight in the morning that's that's a little rough but yeah i like the summers way better for training than i do at the school are you currently taking classes now in the summer or no no, no. Okay. so i got one more semester left or one more year of school left and then i'm done with school oh really okay so this is going to be the last year and then you'll have your degree and you'll be done yep and, and the Marines are paying for that, correct? Yes. Oh, that's yes. awesome. That's yeah. great that you can take advantage of that. Yeah. You know? I tell – if any military guys out there listening and they're getting out, like, use your GI Bill. Go to school. They pay for it. It's it's a free degree. It's not free. You did four years for your country for it, but you should definitely use it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if, you're, if they're going to pay for it, especially after you get out, and especially just coming from someone like you, like you're training full-time, you're doing all these fights – and you were still able to commit to school and do it, I mean, it's doable. It's doable no matter what, so you just should definitely take advantage. Now, I want to kind of talk about or dive into the, the, mental, of, of the mental aspect of fighting. And uh, I kind of mentioned it before about the Marines and, and how, you know, a lot of diligence when you're in the Marines, and, they, and it's, you're very, you know, you follow a schedule, you're on it every day. The first thing I want to ask is, how has the Marine Corps helped you mentally in terms of going into these fights? Yeah, so it, it's definitely something I consider a, as an advantage in the fight game because a lot of these guys aren't military, let alone Marines. Um, when you first start out in the Marines, like, you're there alone. There's no mommy and daddy. Like, you ain't calling them up and being like, hey, mom, this kind of sucks. Like, come help me out. <laughs> it's like your drill instructor yelling at you like, oh, yeah, get on the ground and give me 50 more push-ups. Yes. Roll around in the sand. Go do this. Go do that. And it's not, there's not a single break. Late nights when you're in the field, like, you got to stay up all, like, it's it's a very lonely time at most parts of it in the Marine Corps. You know, when shit goes south, you're across the country. Like, it's not, it's not as easy as hopping in your car and, like, visiting mom and dad. Like, it's not like that. So, when it comes to fighting, like, I've always had that, like, mental, that mental asp, that mental advantage, like, that, that strength, like, that that will to just keep pushing even though the shit sucks. Like, because MMA, is, it's fun when you're winning. It's not fun when you're losing and you're getting your head, you know, you're getting hit a lot. Um, yeah, it's that the Marine Corps definitely 100,000% helped me get that. Not only the discipline, but just the being able to push past your limits and being uncomfortable. Like, nothing about the Marine Corps is comfortable. Nothing about fighting is comfortable. And it's... It, they, they tie in together so well. Yeah, especially what you were just saying, how, you know, when you're in the Marines, you know, you have all your people around you, but what you're going through, like, you're, you you know, you, it's almost very lonely. Like, you, you can't call home. You can't, you know, call your friends to lean on or your mom and dad or whoever you have, your support system. You know, it's who you have with you. And then when you go into that octagon, I mean, it's 1v1. It's just you and your opponent. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, when you step into the octagon, what is that like when you get in there and the cage closes? Like, are you ready to go? Or, like, what's going on in your mind? So it, it's it's a buildup, right? So, you know, you get your opponent, 
and you start training for this specific opponent and you you know you're you're running through scenarios in your head like like at night like before I go to bed like it's hard for me to turn my mind off like I'm thinking about this guy this uh, this, this single individual for hours on the day when I'm training when I'm going to bed like I'm thinking about this guy like can he beat me like is this guy going to beat me in front of all my friends and family and stuff like that so you build up to that and then you're weighing in and you actually see this person in front of you and it's like, dude, like I dreamed about you like for so long. Like I like, you know, like it sounds weird and crazy, but it is what it is. Oh, it is what it is. And then the next day when you wake up, you're like, all right, like, holy shit. Like I'm about to do this again. And I tell myself all the time, I'm like, why do I do this shit? Man? Like, why, <laughs> dude? Like, I'm like, why? I'm not like, I'm not scared. Like, and I, I don't have anything to prove to anybody, but I'm, I am, I am nervous and I'm like, I, you know, I have like a thing I do. I wake up in the morning, I sweat a little bit, get a little shake out. And then like, once you check into that arena, dude, it's the, the energy and the level, like it's, it's quiet. You can hear a pin drop, like from the weigh-ins, everybody's talking, talking shit and like goofing around, stuff like that. But then boom, you're in the back room and everybody's like so quiet. And they're, like, focused in, and, like, you could tell. You could feel the energy. It's, like, everybody's nervous. Everybody wants the fight to go their way, and, you know, you get put in that locker room, and you don't see the guy you're fighting until you actually step in that cage. So you, you're, you do the long little walkout, you know, play the song. I got Run This Town, Jay-Z and Rihanna. Oh, let's fucking yeah. go, dog. <laughs> get a little pumped, and, like, it's weird because when the curtains, before you walk out, you're behind the curtains, you're, like, I'm talking to my coaches. I'm like, yo, coach, like, you gotta, you gotta help me out. Like, what do I do? Like, whatever. I'm freaking out. And then as soon as I walk through the curtains, as soon as I walk through the curtains, it's just totally different, dude. Like, I'm just a different, I'm like possessed in a way. Like, I'm a different human being when I'm in that cage compared to when I'm out it or like working at DJs or like in class or whatever. I'm a different person. I do not, nothing else bothers me. Nothing. It's just me and this guy, and I'm going to win. Yeah, I mean, that it, it's it's so insane to hear the build-up, too. I think going in 1v1 versus someone, and, and you were just saying it right now, and I'm going to try to wrap it all together here with the way I'm thinking about it, but, you know, behind the scenes, before you get out to the flash and lights, the crowd chant and everything going, the octagon closes, like, the build-up to that moment has got to be crazy in your mind because – you know, you're going into battle. I mean, you're going, and this guy, this guy's going to be swinging on you. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. I don't think not even I can kind of imagine this because I'm sure once you go through it, like once or twice, now, you know what you're getting yourself into. You know, I've yeah. never been through that, um, where I'm going into a fight and I'm like, okay, this guy's going to hit me or whatever. And then I've never experienced somebody doing that and then going back for it again. So I think one of the things I think is huge for people to do in life is to almost, I relate it back to fitness, and this is not, you know, as similar to going into battle against somebody and fighting somebody one-on-one, -on -one, but a lot of the times, I like to just lift alone, because when you're going through certain emotions, I think it's important for people to figure out how to control those emotions, so yeah. there may be, and it, it has to do with the way almost life is going, right, so it, it it's interesting, because when you're walking out to that octagon, there's no other option, like, there's no other way you're going in, so no matter what has happened to you over the past month, week, maybe you got injured in camp, maybe something ha happened outside of that, some family issue, like, you're going in, and you got to go to battle, and I think something that has helped me over the years with everything that I have going on is, you know, being in the gym, or training, or doing something like that alone, because it allowed me to learn how to channel emotions, and I think, People don't always, I mean, you see these people that are online doing the fitness thing and all this. I don't think people realize that when you're going in and doing something like that, everything else that was going on in life doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you, when you step in that octagon, it's you versus the other guy and that's it. Yeah. And, and so it, it's almost like when the octagon closes, everything else closes behind it and it's just you and him. So have you learned <laughs> or going back to this whole channeling the emotions, have you gone through a fa uh, any phases or any changes over time where you've learned how to control certain emotions such as sadness or anger or frustration when you're going into that? So all those things you just said, like, they happen through, like, you know, people just, they just see you fight in the cage and, like, they see you for, you know, those 15 minutes or 20, 25 minutes in the cage fighting and that's it. They don't see all the sacrifice behind the scenes, not getting, like, my dad would hit me up and be like, yo, kid, like, when are you going to come, and, like, visit, whatever? And I'm like, dude, I can't, like, I got to do this for, my family like you know for me and it's it's the loneliest sport in the world like 
There's no team to get your back. Like, you're, well, we have teammates and stuff, but when you lose, you lose. Nobody else. Like, it's a very lonely sport. I can't stress that enough. Um, all the sacrifice, all the time, all the hours. When your friends are going out and partying, like, your best friends that you really want to, like, hang out with and see, you don't, you can't do that stuff. Like, my friends know now, like, when I'm getting ready for a fight, they, they won't even hit me up with asking to hang out because they just know it'll, I'll be like, damn, like, I really want to, but I can't. And it just adds a little extra emotion towards it. Um, tying it back into, like, you know, the win- the winning part's great, but then when you lose, that's when it really is, it is, it is fucking lonely, man. <sighs> you know, I lost, I lost not too long ago. And it was a war. It was a, probably the craziest fight I've ever been into. My face was all bloodied up. Everybody was, like, freaking out. And, um, you know, initially you get the, hey, man, like, great fight. Like, hope you're doing well. And then it's, like, your phone's just not buzzing. Like, nobody's really – the only people that were really checking on me were my coach and, you know, my dad and mom. And, yeah, that's, that's a very hard part about fighting. But, you know, I love it. It's it's something you got to want to do. You know, you got to have the, the drive, the will to push past those mental things. And like you said, like lifting in the gym and loneliness, like, yeah, it's good to put yourself in those positions because when something in life happens, like, you'll be ready for it. I, yeah, fighting is life. <laughs> the The lessons you learn, I think, from a loss are probably – even way better than you do from learning or better than the lessons you learn from a win. And I think in that moment when you lose something or it's tough for me, again, I don't fight, but I I remember a time at Reds when everything was just starting to take off. This is right around the time that you were coming. Right. And I had, um, I had a bar manager and everything was going great. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like it's starting to take off, like all this hard work I'm putting in, it's, it's going great. I feel great. I feel like everything's, you know, going the way I want it to go. Right. Almost like the pre-fight, you're getting ready. You're like, dude, I feel great. This is a great camp. We're ready to go. Then you get in there and it's time to compete. And when you get that loss, it hits. And so I had this bar manager and he was really helping me out because the bar life is very tough. You know, it's like you, it's a very grueling schedule and it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work and everything was starting to take off. And I'm like, this is great. I feel great about where everything's going. And then, you know, something happened. I won't get into the details, but you know, uh, he started to not perform the way he was performing prior as a bar manager and, and holding it down the way he was supposed to hold it down. And I had to fire him. And when I fired him, there was nobody else around. It was just me. And I started to, I was sleeping three hours a night coming right back to Reds after closing the night before, and he, all the shifts that he was supposed to be working, I had to work, and it just started just, when I needed that the most is when it all fell apart. And I was like, that to me was like the big, I was like, damn, everything was going so great, and then that just hit me. And I'm like, you know, I'm just sitting there in the office, and I'm almost like, why the fuck did this happen, or why did this happen to me? And then as you push past that moment and you get past that whole sector or that whole time period of when you're down low, you start to realize moving forward, you're like, holy shit, I just went through all that. So now whatever comes my way, I could get through that. And you almost kind of forget what it's like to lose, you know, like everything's going so good for such a long period of time. And then something like that hits you and you're like, damn, like that was me. Like I lost a lot in high school, like just in life in general. Girls, wrestling, sports, like, you know, there was a lot of shit that I lost in. And then, like, I got home from the Marine Corps. Life was great. I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm so happy to be back. And I'm winning fights. Like, I went 6-0 and as an amateur, so I didn't lose for, like, three, two, two and a half, three years. I just didn't lose. And then made my pro debut. Great win. I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm unstoppable. Like, I'm going so far with this. And... Then I got that first loss, and I remember just sitting in the back, just like, what the fuck happened? Like, what like, what went wrong? What did I do wrong? And, like, you keep playing that scenario back. You're like, what if it happened this way? What if I did win this? What if I did this instead? And it's just part of life. You learn more, li- you learn more in life when you lose. Yeah. Well, you know what's you, – you mentioned you played baseball, like, growing up. With the, and so I played baseball my whole life as well. The interesting thing about baseball is it, it, it is a game of failure. Like, it's a game of failure. If you succeed three out of ten times, you're considered a Hall of Famer, you know, as a hitter. Um, And I think 
as you continue to move on, and uh, who, who's the quote? I think it was Michael Jordan. He says, I've missed all these shots. I've lost more times than I could count and all this. And he's like, the reason I'm so successful is because I had all those losses. You know, I think when that type of thing happens, the lessons you learn from it just continue to carry you through. Now, when you lost, in terms of getting back into the octagon, what was your mind state? Like, what were you thinking about once you lost, where you're like, I want to get back as soon as possible? Or was, it, was there a couple of days where you were, like, kind of down and you were like, okay, I got to relax? What were you thinking when that happened? Oh, I was down for sure, but I still showed up to the gym. I lost that fight. I woke up. I lost that fight on Saturday. I woke up on Sunday, and I drove home um, by myself. And it was a very lonely, long hour and a half drive for me, see. And I just popped through the gym, and there's people there. And one of my coaches was there, and I, you know, he showed me what I did wrong in the fight, and then, you know, I fixed it right away, and I just kept showing up. That's a big part of it, just keep showing up, um, being consistent. And it sucked. I didn't want to be there for, like, a whole two weeks. I didn't want to be there. I was down. I was depressed. But you just got to, like, I know where I want to be in life. I know where my goals are, and I know what I have to do to get there. So I just kept pushing through. and It ain't easy, but what in life is easy, you know? Yeah, what anything worth going for is not easy. And like, yeah. dude, you saying that, so I'm getting fired the fuck up right now, <laughs> dog. I'm really getting juiced because I've said it before on this podcast. The one thing I think I've learned through everything in life is that you got to show up. That is the number one thing I've learned. It's like no matter what, and it goes back to what we were saying before, you know, people don't always see what's going on in the outside of your life, you know? Like they yeah. only see you in the octagon fighting this guy, but they don't see everything that led up to that. And you're going through all these different things, but the most important thing that you have to learn or that I think people can learn is that you got to show up and you just said it. And it's like that lesson right there. You, you even said it after you lose, you're down, you're feeling bad. You went to the gym, you pointed out what, what went wrong in the fight. And then like, you know, the next couple of days you're like, damn, I didn't even want to be there, but you know what? I knew what I had to do. And so when you know what you have to do to get where you want to go, the most important thing you can do is show up and keep getting after it, even when you don't want to be there. And I think a lot of people talk about the whole uh, motivation thing. Like, you're, you're not always going to be motivated, you oh, know, but yeah. if you know how to be consistent, if you know that that is what's going to build. And I think this is something that I've started to learn more recently is, you know, there's a lot of clips of Kobe Bryant, who is arguably the greatest player to ever play in the NBA. And he talks about how all these little victories and all these things you do, all these workouts, they compound, right? So he always talks about waking up three or four hours earlier than the guy, you know, before you. And you're getting a workout in so that when he comes down to eat breakfast and get ready to go to his workout, you're eating breakfast already post-workout and getting ready to go for your second one. And then you relax, you get ready, and then you get a third workout in. And he goes, over time, he's like, if you've done three workouts, whereas this person's only done one or two, Think about how far ahead that yeah. puts you. And and at first, when he was when I was watching these clips and hearing that, I was like, mm, you know, I don't know, maybe it's better. But it really, there's a whole compounding effect of how much more work you're doing. But it's it's all about showing up because I'm sure there's days where he was like, you know what, maybe tomorrow I'll just sleep in and I'll just do two workouts. But instead, he woke up and he went and he got that third one yeah. in before anybody else. And I think that compounds. And I think what you were just saying, you know, if you don't want to be there, it doesn't matter if you're trying to get somewhere and you know what actions you have to take to get there, the most important thing is showing up yeah, and doing it. 100%. And, you know, you could ask anybody that I went to high school with that you know. Like, if you had asked them, do you think Eric would have been, like, a professional fighter? They would have been like, fuck no. <laughs> They'd have been like, hell no. I was a very average wrestler. I, you know, I worked my ass off, but I was very average. I wasn't really gifted with any, like, natural athletic abilities. But... You know, I get I get DMs from kids I went to high school with, and they're like, "Dude, you really are like that guy. Like, a, you're about that life." Like, and and I give people advice all the time, and I'm like, "Dude, like, if you really just want to do something, like, just freaking do it, dude." Like, but yeah, it's it's crazy to think about. Like, talking to you about this like now is just like wild to me. Like, how far I came, disappearing from four years after high school in the Marine Corps, like n not really having a trace in Jersey. And then just out of nowhere showing up and fighting and beating people's ass. Like, <laughs> it's pretty wild to it's think about. Insane, like, it's insane, to be honest. Yeah. Two like, days after you got out was oh, the yeah. fight, right? Yeah, yeah. With no training, just in it, just yeah. going full force. Yeah, I mean, so when you got back and you started training and you went to school full time, 
were you able to reconnect with your friends and your family like you wanted to almost after being in the Marine Corps? Because I would imagine, you know, when you're in the Marine Corps, like you were just saying, you're away from everybody. You don't get to see everybody. Now you come back. You're committed to doing this fight life. You're also in school. Were you able to connect with your friends and family as much as you wanted to when you first got back? Or was it right into training and all that and you kind of think you might have been able to see them more or not? Well, I had a very good friend group. Like, my friends, like, even when I was in, they would hit me up and, like, check in, on, check in on me and stuff like that. And they did a good job, and I applaud them for this. My friends Alex, Kevin, Corey, Johnny, like, they made sure they took the steps to, you know, come see me, hang out with me, make sure I was good. Because when I just got out of the Marine Corps, I was a little, like, standoffish. Like, I didn't know how to act, really, like, because I've been so disconnected from just normal life compared to military life. Yeah. So... That I'm so thankful for and blessed for. But, yeah, you're right. Like, I get, I have more trouble now seeing them and stuff like that just because, like, we're all getting a little older and, you know, fighting at the professional level definitely takes a lot more out of you. And there's definitely, definitely days I want to just, you know, go chill with the boys when they're all drinking at the beach and stuff like that. But, like, I can't. Like, I have to train. And I'm not mad about it. Yeah, getting out of the military and then trying to reconnect is definitely hard, but you just got to have people that want to be around you. Like, part of that just beca- comes from being a good dude. Like, if you're a piece of shit, no one's going to want to hang out with you. But, like, if you're a good dude, you have a good heart, and you do the right thing, and you're just genuinely a nice person, like, your friends are going to want to hang out with you and stuff like that. Yeah, and they're going to want to support you even more. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's funny you say that because I think one of the most important lessons I've learned throughout baseball is that, I rarely remember how good somebody was or the first thing I talk about when I talk about a teammate from the past or when somebody brings somebody up is not how good they were. It's what they were like as a teammate or what they were like as a person. And I think one of the lessons I learned a long time ago, it was from, uh, I would say even a mentor of mine. He's a good friend, Mike Condon. I've been training at his gym forever. And he said, he said that to me. He, He said, no one remembers how good you were. They remember what kind of teammate you were, what kind of person you were. And that's, that legacy will carry on far past because, listen, there's going to be someone coming up behind you that's just as good, if not better. There always will be. And so people aren't going to look back and say, okay, this person was one of the greatest of all. They want to remember who you were as a person, and they're going to talk about that as well. Now, of course, you know, the accolades and things like that, the accomplishments, it's always in the conversation. Yeah, but it's, I think, and, you know, talking about people, when people ask me, and we were talking about this before, but when people ask me about somebody – you know, that is a friend of mine and all that. It's like the first thing I say is like, yo, that's my guy. Or yeah, she was always at red. She was a good friend of mine. And I think that's one of the most important things that I've carried moving forward is when somebody asks about me, I want that person to have that same reaction. I want them to be like, no, red was, he was always super nice. He always took care of us. He always made sure we were feeling comfortable. And I think that goes a a long way. And, And keeping relationships in life as you continue to meet people, as well as all your old friends, how you were as a person and how you treated other people, that's what they remember, and that's what continues to keep those relationships strong. One thousand percent. Like, just, it's not, it's like me and you talking like, oh, yeah, you're a good dude, whatever. But it's like what that person's going to say, like, when they're out at the bar or whatever, and they're talking to a random person, they're like, oh, you know so-and-so? And it's like, do you want that person to be like, oh, yeah, he's like, all right. Or, yo, that's a that's a good-ass dude. Like, just being a good person gets you so far in life. It's not, it's, it's I don't know why, like, people just, aren't acting like that like it blows my mind it it is interesting and i don't know like i always ask people about social media right nowadays because it's so crazy what's going on with social media but it's one of the things where people can put on a show and you won't know because you might not know them then once you get to know them you're like wait a second this isn't that person like everything i see on social media isn't exactly what that person is made out to be that isn't exactly who i thought they were because people always they say people will always remember how you treat them I, I, whenever I have felt disrespect from somebody or bad energy, I've never forgot that. Yeah. I've never forgot yeah. that, you know, especially because I try to make a point of greeting everybody else with good energy, you know? And so when that happens, it's like something I never forget. What, what do you make of social media currently, you know, nowadays? <sighs> well, there's, especially in the fight game, social media has become such a big thing. Like, and you get a lot of these guys getting fights, like million-dollar fights, just from running their mouth on social media. Um, 
yeah, there's definitely a lot of fakeness out there. Um, but those are just the people I don't hang out with. Like I surround myself with people like they, they are who they are. Like on my social media, I'll put up my like clips or whatever, or, but like you'll see on my feed, like it's got a picture with my mom, picture of my brother. Like, you know, those are the people I enjoy hanging out with. Like nothing's fake about me on social media. You know, sometimes I'll come up with like corny little funny caption, but yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. You meet somebody in person and on social media, you're like, yo, this person's really cool. And then in person, they suck. Yeah. <laughs> There's <laughs> no other way to put it. There's no other way to put it. I'm then. like, damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I definitely, I'm not ever going to, I'm not going to mention any names, but I've met, um, I followed somebody on social media and I was like, yeah, they're, this, this person's really cool. And then I met him in person and I tap my boy on my shoulder. I'm like, yeah, this guy sucks. <laughs> like, yeah, dude, it's, it's, it really is crazy. But we live in an age where you're able to do that, you know? Yeah. And I think people see that, they exploit that, and they take advantage of it because they know not everybody's going to be able to actually meet them in person. But you know what? When that happens, when you actually meet the person or you, 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 know, you, you the thing is in New Jersey, especially, it's very, it's smaller than you think. You know, yeah. New Jersey's the greatest state in the union. I say it all the time. Yeah, but 100%. You're, you're pro- the- dude, <laughs> all day, every day. This is the greatest state in the fucking union. Yep. It is what it is. Everybody needs to understand this. If you don't agree, I've never been wrong in my life. So there you go. <laughs> you know, you got to be incorrect. It just, it is what it is. But We're on the same page. Dude. <laughs> I tell everybody all the time, I'm like, why wouldn't you live in Jersey? No, it's just okay. efficiency. I mean, it's just amazing. Like the energy, the efficiency, everything that goes on here. Every time I find myself away from Jersey for a while, I always find myself wanting to get back. Yep. And, you know, going back to like it's smaller than you think, you're probably going to meet the person that you see on social media or that you've seen somewhere else, or you're going to meet somebody that knows them. And so it was funny. When Reds took off, and I try to explain this to everybody about why, you know, when, when I go out with people, they're like, Jesus, you know all these people and all that. I'm like, well, when Reds took off in, you know, at that time in New Jersey, there was nowhere to go, right? So I was the only one pushing the limits and letting people in. And when that happened, I couldn't post anything on social media. But all the kids I n- knew and became friends with at Reds, they were posting on their social media. Nowhere else really in the state had anywhere to go. So all their friends from other colleges were watching what was going on. And they're like, what is this place, Reds? Who is this guy, Red, and what's going on? And that connection of just knowing, even if it was just one person, you think about all the people who came through the Reds that year, that means at least one more of their friends saw that, and then one of their friends saw it. And so it's you start to realize, this is where it really came together for me, is that everybody's connected. It doesn't even have to be just Jersey. I mean, this is just in life. You will probably end up meeting somebody that is connected to somebody else you yeah. thought you may have never. Jersey is so small and weird like that. It's insane. And... Talking about Reds, I, I got to tell you about my bar idea. Okay, let's hear it. Let's so fucking I, I, go. I, I let's always go. Said, I always said, I was like, <laughs> if I start making McGregor money, I want to I wanna open up a bar and then listen. So I know what it's let's like. I know go. what it's like to struggle as an up-and-coming MMA fighter. I'm literally going through it right now. But have a bar and then in the basement of it, have an MMA gym. Wow. Shout, listen, showers, like – you know, have, like, uniforms ready, and then after the fighter's done training, whatever, they just go cl- upstairs, clock in, start working, making money. So they they get to train at the facility as long as they're working. You know, they're making some cash, you know. it'll ha- There'll be a nice little sign outside that says, full disclosure, every bouncer here is an MMA fighter. <laughs> <laughs> It'll definitely be the safest bar in New that, Jersey. That will one hundred percent be the safest bar. And in New then, Jersey. like you know, you have like a dance floor, stage, whatever. Obviously, you hire like regular people to like you know work the bar and stuff. You don't. I don't think you could trust an MMA fighter we're surrounded by alcohol. <laughs> yeah. I'm just. I'm just gonna be honest yeah. from experience. But and then you have like a section of the bar where it's like VIP members only, and it's where you like. Because how many times have you gone out like? to DJs, for example, or any other bar, and you're like, I really want to watch these fights or something, but the bar happens to not be playing them. You have a section of the bar where you swipe your little VIP card, you go in and you can watch the fights. Okay. Your girl could chill and dance, whatever. (laughs) And then right after the fight's over, you bounce back. It's just just crazy. Dude, let's open this fucking bar right now. I'm (laughs) telling you, I'm, I'm in for this idea, dude. Basement. MMA gym, MMA facility, like, you got showers in the back, and then right after you're done training, you could just 
bounce up there, hop in for work. This is ideal because listen, and I'm I'm building a room there that I'm going to live at because we're going to be in on this together. <laughs> okay. I'm going to I'm going to live there. Oh, we'll have and, a, we'll have we'll live like upstairs. <laughs> yeah, the third level, right across from each other, just like. <laughs> What's up, bro? <laughs> Third level penthouse. Then we got the bar downstairs and then below in the basement, full on MMA gym, training facility, everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's a done deal for me. I'm in. That's I'm lob locked on that, dog. Like, <laughs> staple it right now on the red cast. Today, it's happening. Let's fucking go. What's do go. you have a name in mind or we don't know yet? Maybe I could tie my MMA name into it. Yes. Something with nighttime. And You're Eric reds. Nighttime Nolan. So I mean nightlife, nighttime, we'll have to tie that in somehow. Night, nighttime at Reds. No, <laughs> which you all know was the goat time at Reds anyway. Let's fucking do it, dog. Oh. I, that's a fucking, how long have you been thinking about this? Dude, honestly, ever since I like started <laughs> getting better at fighting. Dude, it's a legendary idea. I started watching idea. McGregor's like documentary and I was like, this motherfucker. I was like, if I had this money, this is what I would do with it. The other day I saw the lottery is at like 700 mil or something. And I bought one ticket. I bought one ticket and I was like. God, if you're really listening, dude, <laughs> please. I need to open up this bar, bro. <laughs> That's all I was thinking. Dude, I'm telling you. Help me like, get back in action yeah. in, the, in the nightlight. Dude, that is a fucking sick idea. You know what's funny is when we first opened Reds, I told my father and my uncle, I'm like, we got to put a room in there. We got to put a shower. Like, because you think about the bar life, I don't think people realize how many hours you're there. Like, you're there. I mean, especially... You talk about Reds. Of course, you could hire a manager and things like that to be the person that's mainly there. But at Reds in New Brunswick, it was a college bar. It was like the stakes were high. I had to be there every single day. So I was like, I need a shower. I need, and eventually I did end up moving to New Brunswick, which was cool. But for a while, I was like commuting back and forth, and it's just brutal. I mean, the, the so. Oh, and if your bar, just, and if your bar becomes successful, forget about it. You got to, you know what I'm saying? That's what, and then like driving to MMA, back to my house to shower, and then going to the bar and working. No, I could just train under the bar shower at the bar and then boom I'm in. fun deal and when when it's not so busy you could hop down and get the workout in you know you have time yeah. you know and then that way you're not waiting on like the thing with me was whenever i would leave to go work out which is something that i've committed to over the last couple of years is making sure i get my workouts in it's like if you're leaving the bar at any moment you don't know what could happen like fucking especially at a college bar it's like 50 kids could walk in right now and then you're slammed and you got fucking nobody's there why it's like you don't know so imagine if we had that downstairs we could just hop downstairs grab a quick workout we're looking at the cameras if it gets busy hop right back upstairs it's done it's a win-win-win i mean it's all it's automatic we're in, we're in on it this is an amazing a multi-billion dollar idea yeah. we're gonna fucking open these Thank gyms you, you the, know my, my one teammate was like are you out of your fucking mind? And I was like, I was like, what? And then this goes back. I had another crazy idea called fight house. Okay. Where like me and all my teammates, we get a house and we live there together and we just get some dude to like document our life at fight house. And you would get to see our whole day training. And then like, obviously after we win like a crazy party and it'd be a sick documentary. And I like, Want to, I, didn't know, I don't know anybody at Netflix, but, like, I wanted to shoot them that idea and be like, yo, get us a house. Get let's us a content it. house. Let's start filming this doc, and let's put it out. We'll call it Fight House. We have four up, five, six up-and-coming fighters that are going to be big. Like, they're at, they we're all, like, at the low level right now. Like, imagine documenting that, like, kind of how Conor McGregor has. And he was like, are you out of your fucking mind? He's <laughs> like, what's up with you and your ideas? <laughs> Is it you retarded? I think both are great ideas because, listen, especially if the bar is successful, forget about it. The bar is making money, and then you got the gym downstairs to train at. It's done deal, you know? Yeah. All the bouncers and MMA guys, I mean, it's, it's auto lock. It's like Nobody's you, you know, mess around. No, man. everyone's, everyone's going to know when they walk in this is not the spot to cause issues, you know? No. I like and the VIP area, too, where they're showing the fights, you know? You know what's crazy is what, the way they charge bars for the UFC fights and all that is, and this is why we really never got it at Reds, is because they charge per, per like, TV, yeah, right? like per, well, it's based on your capacity. So like if your capacity is huge, it's a percentage of the capacity that you have to pay. So it's like, wow. you know, we, our capacity at New Brunswick was like listed was like 244. So it was like you're paying a pay-per-view, you know, buy per that, not to the full extent of the 244, but it's very expensive. You know, the more capacity you have, because they're just basing it on the fact that you're going to bring in a full house. 
So like, oh, we need to charge for you know, all these people that are going to be. Yeah, in so, I didn't know that. I yeah. thought it was like per TV. Yeah, it's like good to know. Yeah, it's it's. But you know what? At the Reds in Carlstadt, they always get the fights. It's more of a sports bar, so they always get a crowd. I'm taking notes. Because, yeah, dude, yeah, listen, we'll start it right now. I'm ready to go. The day you say you're ready to open this bar, I'm in because yeah, listen, I'm locked in. We'll open up. I got all the system. We'll bring in. We'll bring in all the the POS system. We got people. We got our contacts for the liquor. We're done. Deal. It's over. It can happen in a day. Call up my dad and my uncle. Say, listen, I need all the contacts. We're ready to go. Let's. What run are we it. doing here? Let's yeah. Just, what are, What are we doing on the podcast go, right now? Listen, this we up. need to take a breather from the pod. You know what? We'll have a podcast studio downstairs as well. Oh, somewhere in the gym. 100%. Soundproof. I mean, this is just a system we're building, an absolute warehouse of just greatness. And it's going to be a bar, penthouse suites above, MMA full training gym below, with with a weight room. We're going to be ready we're for training. Fuck around and have I'm like dialed for this. this <laughs> we're going to have a whole military, dude. We're going to be fucking. We're going to start getting into freaking buying tanks and shit. <laughs> A Reds tank. <laughs> Listen, if we're going to war, I said it with Matt Cat. I said Matt Cat's the first person I'm calling. You're going to be the second, and we're going into that fight ready to go. That's and then I'll have to I'll have to call my boy Skyler, of course, who was also in the Marines. He'll he'll help lead the charge on that. And by the way, for everybody who's saying that I'm against Goggins, I don't know if you saw this, but David Goggins, obviously, you know yeah. who's going to carry the boats. I made a video on TikTok, and I was like, I just dropped the yacht off. Like I don't know if you saw this video. It went viral twice. I posted it two years ago, and or last summer. And then I posted it this summer, same exact day, a year later, July 14th. It got 790,000 views the first time. It's got over 900,000 now. Same exact video. And everybody's trying to pin me against Goggins because I was like, Goggins? He asked who's going to carry the boats, but I just dropped a yacht off at the top of this thing. And it went crazy, right? The Jersey wit, dude. It's the Jersey mind right there. That's all it was. When I saw that video, that was my reaction. Oh. And I was hiking Cocoa Head in Hawaii. You know we have to do better than anybody. I mean, that's what... from Jersey, you just have, you to, have do to do better. So everybody's trying to pin me against Goggins. Listen, I'm not against Goggins. Goggins is one of the first people I'm calling as well because I need him to lead the charge into battle. That guy is insane. Yeah, I mean that guy's on another level. So I ain't against Goggins. Goggins, if you're seeing this, he already knows. He's got the. He's already. He can't be phased mentally, so he probably knows the internet's just trying to pin us against each other. No, I'm with Goggins all day. Nothing but respect. He's an absolute animal. If we're going into battle, there's no chance we lose. It's all time. 100%. But we're we're gonna hang up like a thing like this, but we're just David Goggins' face in the bar, and it's gonna say boats and yachts because we need both. <laughs> Listen, boats are big, but they're not big enough for people in Jersey. We need yachts. That's all I'm saying. That that's what I'm saying on that. So. But I want to go back to this um, Conor McGregor because you just that that sparked that yeah. whole thing, the, having the Conor McGregor money, right? I think what a lot of people see, and and we were talking about the social media thing too, how people can like work their way into a million dollar fight just because they have this crazy awareness on social media and they're talking shit. What is your opinion on this? So you know, with McGregor, the big thing for me with McGregor was that he was this crazy, you know, character. He was this guy that. Everybody just gravitated towards because of his energy, because of the way he presented himself, the way he talked shit. But in, in all honesty, he it wasn't it wasn't a character. It was him. He backed it up. He backed it up. Yeah. That's where I'm going with this. People tend to think that just because they start talking shit and they drive all these views and all that, that they're going to end up being like Conor McGregor. Yeah. I think what people forget is that to get to a level of where he's at, you have to have the skill to back up whatever you're talking. Because if you think about how many people... You have put, tried that same route. You got to put the time in. You got to yes. put the energy and the effort, and like you have to be possessed about it. Like it's, I a lot of people rip McGregor now because he like yeah he had a couple tough fights that he lost, but when he was up and coming, dude, like he was that guy. And I always like catch people like you know they're listening to all these motivational clips of like McGregor's mindset and like listening to him and like thinking, but like you're not record dude like and you have to find yourself you have to motivate yourself you have to i love motivational speakers and sometimes i'll put on a little clip and i'll listen to them and stuff like that but you know you gotta make that like find your own words from that and like motivate yourself like because the only thing that could really drive you is yourself like listening to those clips and like thinking you're gonna turn out like him it's delusional. It's crazy. You you didn't have the same struggle, the same story, the same hardships that he had. So, like, yeah, you could put yourself in more of a better mindset, but it's probably not going to work out as good for you as it did him because you don't have his story. Same as, it, like, me and you. We have different stories. Like, I could tell you all my hardships and all this and mindset and stuff like that, and it definitely helps people, but you got to find that. From what I'm saying, like, you got to put it in your own words and motivate yourself in a 
way, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I mean, so that's such a big thing now is I think people see these and it goes back to the whole motivation versus discipline. It's like yeah. you could be motivated for, you're, you're only going to be motivated for a specific amount of time. You know, you can only have that motivation for so long, but at the end of the day, when consistency is what you need, when you need to show up, when you don't want to do it, that's what makes the difference. And I think people saw what Conor McGregor did. I think a lot of people started to try to be Conor McGregor, right? And I think trying to be somebody else is the worst thing you could do because it, what happens is, and going back to the, the parallel with, with the skill, McGregor was saying all this stuff. He was just being who he was. And then when he got in the octagon, he, first of all, he did what he said he was going to do, like to the T exactly, like Mystic Mac. But the skill is what drove him. And, that, and, and I say this all the time. I know a lot of DJs, right? And I think a lot of people now see how big house music is and they see the show that all these DJs are putting on. But what got them to the point of where everybody saw that was their skill and their talent. And I try to, you know, drive that into people is that the skill and the talent is what's going to carry you all the way to where you want to go. And then the show is next, yes. you know? And so like people see John summit and they see him, they, he has a massive party in the booth and there's all these girls dancing and all this stuff. And he's got his shirt all the way on button headphones over. He's fucking drinking Casamigos, right? Think about how good his songs are. That's what propelled him to that point. You know, you, you can only put on a show and that can only get you so far if you don't have the skill. And the thing with Conor McGregor, which is why I was interested to get your opinion on it, is everybody saw how crazy he was. Everybody saw this, you know, all that shit he was talking and all that. And they're like, oh, I could do that and that could get me fights. And it did get people fights. It got people into the, uh, you know, UFC um, sector and it got them big fights and it got them paid but the ones who weren't good enough didn't last, and they fell off, and the question yeah. is, where are they now? Now, McGregor might have lost his last couple fights, but think about all he did prior to that to now where he is still in the conversation at any point in time yeah. during the UFC. I, I can't scroll through my TikTok without seeing a video about him, and he hasn't fought in a while, and he probably won't fight for a while. And he was the first like MMA fighter that I really was like, I am a big fan of. Like When I was watching him in high school, um, and throughout the whole my whole time in the Marine Corps, I was like such a big McGregor fan. Like I bought the UFC McGregor shirt. Like I was a big fan, and so I could never like diss him in any type of way, no matter what, just because I was such a big fan. Like I used to tweet at people, like <laughs> "Fuck you, McGregor's gonna knock him out." Yeah. I used to get into it. Yeah, I was I was always a big fan of McGregor, you know, and. Uh, of course, with any amount of success, I mean, when you have that amount of success, you're going to have the ups and the downs, but he just, the things he has said over time, he's proven that he truly believes them yeah. and he's lived it out, you know? And so, again, it's just something where, to me, people see that and they try to do that because they think that's going to get them to where they want to go. It's like, dude, if you had went 0-6 in amateur instead of 6-0, and you're not going to be fighting where you are right no, now. You know, the skill not. and the talent, and, and that is what is most important, I think, and then comes the show. Yes. Now... When it comes to the show, how do you feel about being in the octagon? Do you like to put on a show? you like to put on a battle? Do you kind of... Because there's a lot of MMA fighters who... You look at, like, Michael Chandler, right? He's a great fighter, right? Yes. And I think he hasn't... when he Since the UFC contract that he signed, his wins and his losses, it hasn't been all wins. I think it's been mostly losses, honestly. But he still continues to fight oh, against sure. all the highest-level guys and always have the biggest fights. In fact, he was supposed to... Fight McGregor if McGregor ends up uh, getting in the USADA pool, which who knows if he's ever going to enter that. I mean, he's yeah. looking pretty juiced right now. Yeah. Who knows? But filming that, you know, movie, filming yeah, that movie. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but again, going to Chandler, he has put on a show every time he's in there, but he's also performed at a high level. So, where do you find the balance in your game between the show and the skill? When it comes to me, I, I honestly, I just be myself. Like, and there's a. There's a time and place where you could do that stuff, but I don't think I'm at the level yet. I mean, I'm fighting on the regional scene, and I'm on my come up, and there's no reason for me to talk shit to a guy on the regional level. I feel like I, I just don't like talking shit anyway. But if someone talks shit to me, I'll definitely talk shit back. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm from Jersey. Like, yeah, I, I will run my go, mouth. Dog. You want to run your mouth, I'll run my mouth. But I don't like doing that. Um... I pride myself in being, like, Marine Corps, like, trying to be, like, the pride of the Marine Corps, pride of Jersey, like, you know, representing, like, all the people I'm affiliated with and, like, in that aspect. And it comes out naturally. Like, they gave me, like, an interview, a post, like, a post-fight interview. And after it, I was like, oh, my God, 
like, did I sound stupid? And then they like, I, they clipped it up for me and I like saw it and I was like, Oh, I was actually really good. And it's just cause I was myself. So when it comes to that stuff, like, yeah, there is people that, you know, they run their mouth and they do it very well, but then you meet them outside and they're like a really good person, really nice person. Um, I've heard stories like that Colby Covington, if you know him. Oh, who doesn't know Colby Covington? Runs his mouth like a nut job at the UFC. But then, like, you know, he, he, he'll sit there for, like, an hour and, like, take pictures with kids. And, like, he's a very nice dude. That's what I heard. I've never met him, but that's what I've heard. And I think there are a lot of people like that. There's also a lot of people that, you know, they run their mouths and they try to put themselves as, like, this super nice guy. And then they're actually, a, like, a piece of shit. So Yeah. You never really know until you actually get, you know, meet the person and, yeah. and kind of have a couple interactions with them. And even then it's tough to know right off the bat. But I think energy is a huge thing. And I think when you meet somebody and you're greeted with a certain energy, you can kind of feel that out. People you know? feel it, yeah. And 100%. It's, it's like something you can't really explain, but it's if you've been in that position where you felt like the energy is off and then kind of down the road, it always seems like your your feeling your gut feeling was correct yeah and i think that's the energy is a huge tell of all that and and you know what like i i feed off of it in a way where like i so like my last fight in ac i'm coming off of a loss you know it was in ac i didn't think i was gonna sell a lot of tickets because i just lost and at the time it like my record didn't look pretty at all and then i had like 215 people there like so i'm like sold like one of the most tickets out of all that and I'm I'm like fight number six out of 12 and like there was just seeing my logo like walking out and seeing all the people wearing my shirt and it's just like those people aren't there because they have to be there they're there because they want to be there they want to support me and they actually like you know have interacted with me and like they like what I'm doing and they like who I am as a person and what I stand for and what I'm fighting for I think that's big too Cause there's a lot of fighters that are very good, but they don't have that like that factor in them, like that showtime factor or wh- whatever you want to call it. Or you know, they don't have that people feeding off that energy, and that's something that like a lot of people have said. They're like, dude, like genuinely, like I just want you to do good, and I'm like, genuinely, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like appreciate that. Yeah, people can feel again the energy. People can feel it right away, and I think what you just said, kind of having that purpose almost when yeah. you're, when you're going in. And I think going back to our whole thing about you have to show up when, when you find yourself not motivated and you find it hard to show up, I think going back to the reason you started something in the first place is the best way to get yourself to go and show up. You know, when you, when you're, when you're dragging and you wake up and you're tired and you're foggy and you're like, damn, like I could easily just not go right now. If you just take a second and think about the reason you're doing it and, and, think about where you're trying to go that always tends to get me to get back into the gym or you know after a long like you said working at djs you work till 3 or 4 a.m you get everything and and listen when you're there you're working it doesn't matter what is when the night's over forget about just bouncing and watching the rest of the night once it's over you're helping move the tables you're helping moving everything around which is how it's supposed to be and then you got to wake up three hours later and go train you're like damn like i could have just slept in you know but especially on like a saturday when i had to drive to go spar somewhere like pretty far and I'm running off of, like, two hours of sleep, that's when it, like, uh, yeah, 100%. It's just, like, but I remember, I'm, like, why am I fighting? Like, what am I fighting for? And that's what drives me more than anything is, like, there's people that that really support me and believe in me and they want me to do good. And if I don't show up, I feel like I'm doing, I'm being disrespectful to them in a, in a way. Yeah, that responsibility is also something that comes with, especially when you start to have success, you start to feel a little pressure. bit more of respons- yeah, pressure and responsibility, and it's it's on you. But I think that pressure is what pushes people to go to the next level. Yes, you know, once it's on you, you feel it, and you're like, no, like this isn't going to keep me down. It's actually going to push me to where I want to go. Yeah, you know, if I could use it to my advantage. Like when I'm in school, when I'm in school, I'm training, I'm getting beat up, showing up to class with black eyes. Now I have to sit and focus and actually take <laughs> exams and listen to the teacher, and I'm just like sitting there like. Like, yeah. screw this. Dude. It's, like, I, it's, it builds character, though. And, and if you could do it consistently for, like, a week, you've already developed the habit that you could do this if you want to, like, in anything. You know, the gym, running, like, whatever. Like, I used to hate running, but I started running every single night for, like, 30 minutes. I would just run, 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 run. And then it just became routine. 
I was like, ah, oh, whatever, I'll just run. It doesn't matter to me. Once it becomes routine and you continue to do it, I think what people find is that activity starts to become almost like a release as well. When you have all this shit going on in your life and things are going tough and then you get in there and it's almost like, you know, when you go to train, I'm sure there's been times where it's been frustrating, but then you get in there, you train, and you're like, now I remember why I showed up. Because I think it's the same with the gym for me. Like, I'm not always motivated to go, but I always make time. I'm committed three, four days a week, whatever it is. And when I get there and I'm doing it, I'm like, I'm always glad when I'm in the moment. And it goes back to, you know, again, you're not always going to be in the same, you know, mood when you go. Like, it comes down to channeling those emotions and being able to. And I think going back to the whole solo thing versus the, you know, when it's just you versus another guy in the octagon, I, I try to encourage people to, you know, in gym culture, it's very, especially nowadays with the whole TikTok fitness thing, you know, going with your friends and putting on a show. And, and I think people, this isn't anything in life, not just fitness, but doing something by yourself for an extended period of time or making sure you set aside time to do whatever you're doing by yourself to really get in tune with your emotions while you're doing it is so important because I've been at the gym, going back to what I said before, I've been like sad I've been angry. I've been frustrated. I remember when, I remember during the pandemic, dude, like I, I think people know my energy is a lot of positivity and I have a lot of energy. I will say, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Anybody how that <laughs> says otherwise is out of their mind because the first, the first time I ran into you this summer at DJ's when, when I was not working, you, you were like, hey, want a shot, man? What's up? What's oh, up? What's up? dude. We, and that was right after the win. Yeah, really? it might yeah. have been the day after. Yeah, like was, we were and was. Sam Johnson in the and he was just like red. Let's do it twenty five and twenty five. We rip fifty and we just yeah. go. And it's true. My energy always tends to be high, but when you do something alone, you know it, it really challenges you sometimes. Because I remember during the whole pandemic era, again showing up to Reds every day, and you know it was great to be around people and have people coming in and want to be there in a time where no one was able to do anything. You know, and that helped me so much. But the mindset I had after Reds closed was like going back to the whole thing about why. I'm like, why did this happen? Like, you, 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 it was it was the law of equivalent exchange. I say it all the time. If it wasn't for the pandemic, Reds probably would have never taken off to where it was because it never would have given me a chance to push the limits, allow people in, and show people who I really am. And that's what attracted all that energy and made Reds so successful. But it's also the reason that it closed. And I remember after that. And, and I always try to, when I get into this mindset, remember all the good, but I remember being so angry. Like I would go to the gym and I've never felt like this before, but I remember just like wanting to blame people and, and why and, and fuck this person and fuck all these people who did this and did that and they're the reason this is that. And so that anger was something I had never really experienced before in the gym. Because again, my energy, it's like when I go out, I'm always in a good mood, I'm always ready to go. In the gym, I was the same way. I was always bring high energy, but that anger, this was the first time that I was ever experiencing that. And, and I learned how to channel that anger. And again, it started to help me channel all my other emotions. Like when I was sad or when something else was going on, going through all these emotions and being in the gym alone and just being able to focus and work out and just go through my thoughts with no one else around, just me, just reflecting and trying to channel that. I tell you what, I got some of the best workouts I've ever yeah. got. And, and now when something else like that happens, I'm able to bring that, I'm able to tap into that part of my brain where I was like, yo, do you remember when you were in that mindset every day going to the gym and doing that? And I've kind of carried that on. Anger is a hard emotion to juggle. It, it really is. Um, especially like, for example, like working at DJs, like there's times I get really angry at stuff, but, and then, but then like, I'm always so non-confrontational. Like, I always try to de-escalate. I'm always trying, like, even just if I'm out at a bar and some dude, like, checks me or whatever, like, I'm not ever, like, yo, what the fuck, man? Like, one, because I get punched in the face every single day. So, <laughs> I don't, like, I don't look for that. But, like, also, it's just, like, I remember, like, you know, like, it's, ang anger has never gotten me anywhere good, you know? But it has made me work my ass off. You know? Yeah, I think the, the channeling is what really has, uh, again, allowed me to do the same, especially when I go to Reds and everybody's around and things might have not been going as well as I want them to. You still need to show up and you have to be welcoming to everybody, you know? Yeah. And it's the same like you were just saying about bouncing it at, at DJs, you know? Anger is going to get you nowhere. Um, acting emotional in a time where you have to put your emotions aside and, and think clearly, it'll never get you where you want to go. But 
going through events like that in life, and I can only imagine what fighting, you know, does and that type of training every day, but I think it teaches you lessons far beyond that, and it helps you in other aspects of your life, like bouncing when you get into a situation or even when you're out at a bar and someone checks you, it's like, wait a second, like, yeah. calm down, we don't need to, this doesn't need to go anywhere. Yep. And I think, so in going to the DJs and talking about the bouncing here, we were talking about it before, you know, when you're looking, I mean, first of all, I want to say this. Going back to my whole energy thing, people see me all crazy and stuff. When I'm at DJs, I also see it from a bar owner perspective, what's going on. I'm always watching. Even if I'm tuned up and I'm having a good time dancing, whatever, you're at the West Bar Station most of the time. Yes. That is one of the craziest stations to be at. It's literally Staten Island. It is literally <laughs> Staten It is, And I talked about this with Swim Cooper about how the Thursday uniforms, the black on black come in, and all of a sudden it takes over the entire bar, and you're like, where am I? You know, how did this happen? But... It's one of the craziest places to be in there because that's where most of the action happens. It's right next to the dance floor. It's probably the most densely populated area in DJs at all times. But you're watching like a hawk, you know? Like, I see that. And it's tough to find, like, people who really... I've gone through so many, you know, at Red's, like, security. I'm like, listen, you're not watching. You have to watch. You have to watch. All you have to do is stand there and watch. That's what you're getting paid to do. And the point is to de-escalate the situation and prevent these situations. If you're watching 99% of the time, you could see something before it happens. You can get there before it happens, and then you could prevent it from happening. And I tried to really hammer that into all the bouncers because once you're reacting instead of preventing, that means something already happened. And that is, like... If you look back and there was a way you could have prevented it, you're going to kick yourself because you're like, you know, I could have been doing better. So I see you watching. And again, all the bouncers there. I don't think Evan lets anybody slip through the crack. I mean, he's just fucking dialed in and he's been running that, you know, security team for a long time. And you can just see everybody's watching, everybody's seeing. And then, of course, when you do have to react, it gets crazy in there. But what are the main things that you kind of look for? We were talking about it before, you know, when you see what's going on, what would trigger you to go over to somebody and be like, hey, let's calm down? Yeah. Um... It's probably like this at all bars, but it, it, it for some reason it happens at DJs per, like every once in a while. But when uh, when the guys are like super aggressive towards like girls, whether it's their girl or like a random girl, and they do the whole touchy feely and they start becoming very like creepy, like yep. And then the girls come up to me or like someone will come up to me and be like, "Yo, like this guy needs to chill," or like I'm uncomfortable. Um, it's just one of my pet peeves, like hitting girls in general just will like that will set me off like oh, it's something dude, my dad forget about it my dad instilled in me like ever since i started wrestling and stuff he was like you will never ever ever lay a hand on a woman he was like i don't even care if she punches you in the face you run away mm-hmm. i don't care if someone calls you a bitch you're running away so that's just something that it's it's just programmed into my brain like don't touch girls especially if they don't want you to be, touch them like it's yeah. different if like Guys are, like, dancing and feeling each other different. I'm talking about, like, guys pressing a girl, like, trying to, like, hit on her, super drunk, super hammered, and, like, starts grabbing her and stuff like that. Like, to me, that's not cool. Yeah, and and for anybody who doesn't know, this is a lot more common than you think. I yeah. saw it all the time at Reds, and it's, it's tough because, again, sometimes you only get one side of the story. So, yeah. you know, you want to always make sure you try to give perspective to it. But you can, again, the energy, you'll feel it out. If, if a girl comes up to you and says that, and you start to watch and you see what's going on, then you kind of feel out the energy and you see what's going on. And this is like so common. And I think a lot of it has to do with maybe not so much as the person's a bad person or the guy's a bad guy. They just might not know how to act. They might be young and they might be immature. And so they may think they're within the guidelines of how they should act, but really they're pushing the limits. And then sometimes you just need to go over and tell them. And then, you know, once you teach them that lesson, because not everybody knows, not everybody's learned. And it's tough, again, you don't ever want anybody, doesn't have to, a guy or girl, to feel uncomfortable in your establishment. Yeah. That's the worst feeling, especially when you're talking about somebody who's a regular, somebody who comes all the time and brings good energy. If they're some, if they come up to you and say that, it's like, wow, you really yeah. got to get on it, you know? And like, you know, like I, I work at pretty much in the same spot at DJs all summer. So the people that go there regularly, like I notice them. They notice me. They become familiar with me. I start to get to know their names. It starts to become this like, relationship where it's like you know like hey listen i'm watching you don't worry like you're safe you're good and then like you know some sometimes somebody will just chuck a drink across the bar and you don't know who did it and then those people are like that guy and I'm yeah like, 
you're my people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. Kind of, it's becomes, it becomes an interesting relationship, especially because, like, I used to never get along with people from New York for some reason. It was just never <laughs> a thing. Even in the Marines, like, when I I got bunked with, like, a kid from New York, and I was like, oh, dude, we're going to fight. Like, and this is when I was, like, shot. I was like, we're going to fight, bro. Like, I'm telling <laughs> you right now, we're going to fight. And then, like, come to find out, West Bar is literally all New Yorkers. Yep. But I get along so well with them. I feel like I'm, like, slowly becoming a freaking New Yorker. Dude. I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. They'll phase you. Dude, They'll phase you into thinking, I, dude, like, I swear. I went, out to, I went out to the city for, like, the first time, like, last week because my teammates were fighting up there, and I was coaching, and I went to this place called The Harbor. and Great spot. Really good time. Super expensive. Like, absolutely outrageously expensive. I got two shots and a Corona. It was, like, 90 bucks. I was like, what the hell? Like, did I break a window? What New York City, on? baby. Don't, they don't play games up no. there. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but, yeah. No. It's it's definitely, honestly, I like, what I enjoy, we were talking about this earlier, but, like, I enjoy the people I work with. Like, the conversations, you know, the connections you make and just the the staff at DJs is just, like, absolutely amazing. Like, I enjoy going to work. You know, sometimes it sucks standing on that box for, like, 11 hours, but, you know, it's it's worth it. Like, those people are fun to work with. They're all, like, great people in general. I don't have a single problem with a single person that works there. And, you know, the people that come in for the DJ's experience, they just make it all better. Yeah. I've met some interesting people. I've met some weirdos. <laughs> I've met some people... I've met some people that are like my friends now. Like, yeah. you know, I'm in group chats with them, whatever. And they're yeah. like, yo, are you working tonight? And I'm like, yes, like yeah. I'll be there. Friday night, you know, you I'm know? Gonna be on that stand. And it's like, it's like cool. Like, and then you, you, and they'll be like, yeah, when are you off? Like, you should come out with us one night and like, I'll just do it. I'm like, all right, screw it. Yeah, I got time. I'm going to go. And I think people don't, see, the people don't always see that side of nightlife is it creates a lot of really good relationships, you yes. know? Of course, it's it's a mass amount of people at a spot like DJs, right? So you're always going to have the good and the bad, right? Look at this but connection. Look at yeah, this connection. Yeah, right? look at this. We're, we're on the pod. We're was, about to open up our own. And room. I told you, bro, you were sta- <laughs> you were working, and I was tuned up, and I'm like, yo, that's Nolan. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm, I swear, but I was hammered, and you were standing next to Mikey G. That's the guy, you know, there was a, uh, you know, the veterans there are, are just great. Yeah. As you said, the whole staff there just hammering that point in at DJs, really all the people that I've got to become close with there over the, the, the years that I've been going, they're all good people. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that has always drawn me to go there. And that's what still draws me to new bars today, like going to Bar A more often now because I have a relationship with Team Tony. You know, he's a great guy, and we got to do the podcast, and we got to tell his story. And it was like, you know, before the last couple of years, I never really got to know him. And then once I got to know him, it's like, that makes you want to go. And DJs, since the day I stepped foot in there, Courtesy of El Flood, you know, he, he was the first one that I knew there, and Jack Pringle as well. Um, you know, they start introducing you to more people, and then, you know, you get to know those people, and once you find out the energy and, and if they're good people or not, that's what will bring you back. And, you know, the people that have been working there for the, la- for the last decade or even more, all good people. And now I start to see there's a lot of new, but the thing about DJs is they always have the veterans there to help bring in the new people, yeah. and you start to feel the balance. And it's cool how I can see from my perspective – everybody working together as one cohesive unit. And it's tough to see that in a spot like that because, again, it's a club and you have everybody so spaced out and things like that. But when you know how it all operates, it, it's cool to see that and it's great to experience that. And that's why I love going and supporting that place is because it's yeah. been like that since the beginning. And I can only imagine, you know, being an employee there, again, you saying that goes a lot further as well because you actually work with these people day in and day yeah. out. And it, it's true. It's just the way it is there. They've always made me, always made me and my friends feel welcome. And that's something I always try to do at Reds It's make people feel welcome because if they feel welcome, they're going to want to come back. Yes. Especially, I mean, in a place like that where it's madness, you you have the chance to show that hospitality and make people feel welcomed in a place where you don't even have to. There's going to be numbers there, you know? Yeah. But and it, it, and it, it shows. And it, and it literally it makes it so much easier to pick out the guys that shouldn't be there because they're bad people. Like Because everybody that's going there is giving off good energy, and then you'll just, you'll just see some dude that's like definitely not – Bringing good vibes. <laughs> Keep a little extra eye on them. And then, you know, sometimes you got to give them the boot. But. Yeah, sometimes you got to let them know. You know, it's – and, again, you always try to – we've talked about this before, actually, at DJs, is, like, when you approach a situation, how you approach a situation is also a very telltale sign of how it's going to yes. go. You know, if there's an issue with people, you don't always have the luxury of being able to just sit there and find out what happened. But if you have that luxury of – 
it hasn't gotten to the point of where you think it's going and you can find out what happened and get the perspective of whatever has been going on, you can prevent it from happening. And that was a big thing at Reds was like, I always tried to approach a situation where you might have had to throw somebody out calmly and really tried to calm, explain the perspective of whatever problem is going on to that person from the other side. Yeah. And I think if you're able to do that, you don't always have, you know, the ability to do that. When there's a, when somebody's swinging, it's over. You know, you got to get in there. If people are swinging, it, that was the thing for me. I only had two rules at Reds. You're going to respect everybody in the establishment, customers and the, and the staff. No fighting. Those were the two rules. And if you broke either, though, I mean, if you're swinging on somebody, if there's a fight, you're out. You know, it's done. There's no, there's no questions asked, you know. Yeah. Especially, I mean, because that's putting other people in danger. And then, of course, the whole respect thing, that goes back to making people feel comfortable. You're disrespecting one of the staff members. You're saying, you know, out-of-pocket stuff to them. If you're saying things that are just making them feel like shit, you're getting the boot. You know, yeah. forget about it. I'm not going to put up with that. Especially when, in nightlife, the amount of hours you're working, have somebody come up and say something disrespectful, see you later. Oh, they, so, sometimes they choose, they, sometimes I really just want to revert to my old ways and just <laughs> kick somebody in the head, but... I'm like, all right, like, they'll, they're just drunk. Like, they're yeah. just drunk. Because I get shit talked to all the time. I'm not the biggest dude, obviously. But for some reason, like, this has been happening, and everybody's been laughing at it at DJ's. <laughs> but I kicked, like, two guys out, I think, for fighting or whatever. And the, f the first thing both of them said to me was, you're small as fuck. Like, you can't do shit. And I'm, I just scratched Wrong guy. Head. You I'm guys like, got the wrong guy to say that to. And then, like, it happened again the other week, and I told everybody, I was like, this guy really just called me small again. And then the, that time, like, my other uh, the bouncer was with me heard it, and he was just laughing his ass off. He was like, bro, I really don't get it. Like, why, why are they calling you small? You're not that small. And I was like, <laughs> I just wanted to start doing trend and just going crazy. <laughs> I was like... I was like, fuck fighting. I'm just going to become a bodybuilder now. And just fucking pump yourself full of steroids and get absolutely juiced yeah. to the fucking gills. Well, that's another thing. Like, being at bars nowadays, like, a lot of, and especially in New Jersey. People don't know this, but New Jersey is, like, a hot spot for MMA. Really? Yes. It's, like, one of the best MMA states. That, us in, like, Florida now, and I would say probably Cali. Big MMA states. And it's another thing. You never know what somebody knows, like. Looking at me, if you, I was just walking down the street and, like, if you didn't catch the side of my ear, you're just looking at me, you'd be like, what the hell? But then I'll tune you up real quick. Dude, you never know. You yeah. never know what – that's why, again, it's always better to revert to the calm situation. Yeah. Always revert to the option of where it's not going to go, where it could go. And it's, it's tough, again. But going back to the whole respect thing, how many – I have said this to you before. I've never gone out and looked for an issue. Like, I've never no. gone out. And there's some people who go out, and, and their goal is to cause an yes. issue. And you, you believe me, you'll learn who they are very quick. Whenever it turns to, like, 1130 when I'm working at DJ's, 1130 is when I call it fight o'clock. Here we go. Because that's when the guys that are going there to get girls, either they're not getting girls, they're getting rejected left and right. So if they ain't going home with a girl, they're fighting. Yep. And then I'm just like, 11.30, some shit's about to go down. And then, <laughs> yeah. sure as shit, usually every night at 11.30, the guys that strike out are the guys that are, like, trying to fight. Especially if they've been there since happy hour, because then you're really deep in the trenches. I mean, happy hour at Jay's goes off, you know? Yeah. And there's people who stay all the way. They'll go They'll go happy hour. They'll go all day. Oh, yeah. I've locked some 10-hour shifts at DJ's before. Oh, I mean, I it'll know. get you, dude. I know. I mean, <laughs> I know. And, and our girl Caroline, forget about it. She'll be there oh open to close. I, Caroline, I remember, see you, Frida. Love you. I remember I was, I, I like clocked in and they were already, your, your group was already there. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what's up, guys? Like, how you doing? Like, <laughs> and then I go on my break. I go on my break. I come back. They're still there. I'm like, okay, guys, you guys are hanging in there. Like, you guys are doing good. And then, like, it's one o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, how are you? I was like, you guys have been here longer than me. You should, yeah. <laughs> you should just at this we, point, you should just clock in. <laughs> we were sitting outside eating the 2 a.m. buff chicken wrap. We shut it down. Caroline and that squad had gone at one o'clock, which is when I think you clocked in, right? They, yeah, yeah, something like so that. So they went, they went at one o'clock before we went to Headliner, which was the night of, um, which was the day of Wax Motif and our and my good friend Brant Wolf, best DJ. I've, I, uh, he's going to be the biggest DJ in the world. He was opening for Wax Motif, so we all went for that. 
And then we actually got Wax. And and by the way, Wax Motif is a massive DJ. He's like one of the biggest. And the rain kind of held people off, so it was a small crowd. But he got into it and he ripped it. He's used to doing... He's done festivals for like 100,000 people, you know? And his team, I met his, uh, his manager. His name was Adam. And I got to meet him. Keats took me up to the booth to go see it for a bit. And I met him and he was a really nice guy. And so their whole squad had great energy, going back to the energy thing. When they were walking down, my good buddy Matt Edwards... He was like, yo, you guys should come to DJ's after this because we're going back. So Wax Motif, his whole team, Adam, the whole squad that they had, they all went to DJ's after and we just sent it the entire night and we just, we shut it down and we're outside eating. 2 a.m. Buff Chicken Wrap is an auto lock for me every night. Grilled chicken. I mean, the guy who makes them, the man is an absolute animal. I mean, he's just, he's back there and he, it was funny. He calls me Buffalo Chicken Wrap. He doesn't know my name, you know, so I'll walk up and he's always back there. And every time I walk up, he knows what order is coming. We're eating them. You walk outside, and you're like, what are you still? You're like, this girl has been here since 1 o'clock yeah. since I started my shift. I was, it was mind Caroline. Blown. I lost I it, I was dude. mind blown. I was like, yeah, you might as well just clock yeah. me. <laughs> Start getting clock paid to be for here. me. Because yeah. you got here an hour before me. <laughs> they they love to party, as do yeah. I. And so yeah. it, it makes but, for a good mix. But it's good, though, because like they have a great energy. They never cause problems. It's like I, I like seeing people like that out. You know what I'm saying? Those are the best people to have at the yeah. bar. The ones that always bring a good time. The ones that could, the ones that don't even care whether or not it's just them and their crew or 100, 200 people. Yeah. They'll be in there bringing that same energy, having a good time. Those are the best. Yeah. And, you, and again, like you said, as you start to work more and you're working every day, you start to see who that is and you, you yeah. see that, you know? So it's cool. Um, so going back to this whole size thing, you fight at 170, correct? Yes. What do you walk around at? Right now, I'm like 188, 190. What is it like having to cut to make that weight? It sucks. Yeah. Um, it, it sucks a lot. Like, it's it's a whole process. Like, there's definitely no drinking alcohol in that time period. Like, I go on a diet for like two two months, usually. I'm like, like I know when I'm, when I'm fighting and I'll start the diet. Um, it's just a lot of like, boring shit man like a lot of boring and like that's another whole thing like I, some days i wish i could just go like i'm the biggest taco bell fan that will ever <laughs> i fucking love taco bell i'll like you know the saying of what would you do for a klondike bar like i would do a lot of shit for taco Bell. let's fucking like, go i'll blast you through this window for taco bell like <laughs> please don't it. so but yeah it's, it's a lot of dieting. It's a lot of, like, just discipline. Like, looking in the fridge and seeing, like, my housemates, like, they sometimes they'll have pizza in there, and I'm like, my palms get sweaty. Yeah. I'm like, damn, dude, now I got to eat this stupid grilled chicken or ground beef. Like, and then, like, I'll get down to, like, 182 the night before I weigh in. So, like, if I'm fighting, th if I'm fighting Friday, you weigh in Thursday. So, Wednesday night, I'll be, like, 182. It's, like, 12 pounds over. And then I'll go to the sauna. I'll sweat out like 10 pounds. So I'll get down to like 72. I'll drink like a bottle of water to, to just put me to sleep. So I'll be like, when I wake up, I'll be like around 173. I sit in a hot bath for like 30 minutes, sweat out the last two. And then I go to, I go to the weigh-ins on weight, 170. And then I rehydrate and I'm ready to go. But the weight, the weight cutting process is a different type of like, miserableness like you're hungry you haven't really had a solid meal in like three days like cause you're tripping out about the weight you're living on a scale like you drink a little sip of water you're like oh let me check step on the scale <laughs> yeah. and you're like all right i could have another sip and then you're like fuck i drank too much <laughs> and then like that's crazy yeah it's it, i mean it's a different type of you know uh, diligence you have to have to do that and it's crazy that the day before you're still around like 12 pounds over so yeah. you're just basically the day before, or leading up to the day before, you're cutting everything except for the water weight, and then you're getting rid of all that yeah. last water weight. So what I do is I water load. So, the pr so I start that process about like a week and a half, two weeks before the weigh-in, where I'm um, taking a lot of water, um, like two gallons a day, and then when you get closer to the like, you're still pounding water. You're you're pissing like I'm, you're peeing all the time, and then. You're cutting your sodium, so you have nothing that's going to retain your water. Like you, no salt, no bread, no no carbs, and nothing like that. So you have nothing that's going to hold that water in you. So when you get into that sauna, like you start dripping, like it literally just comes off you. I look like a different person. It's like like see how my cheeks are now, like they're sucked in. Like 
I'm skinny as hell. Like, literally anybody could beat me up the day of my weigh-ins. Like, I would I would have probably 15 seconds in me, and then I'd just pass out. And because you're not – also, you're not eating a lot around oh. that time either. So that's like food is energy. You All know? you're eating is like proteins and fats. Um, you know, like, yeah, how I eat outside of – like, when I'm, when I'm in training camp is totally different than now. Like, right now, like – you're like, yo, let's go grab a slice. Like, I would definitely go and eat a slice. But when I'm getting ready for a fight, none of that shit. It also it also goes into that mentality thing. Like, you know, you're, you're going to bed at night, and you know you had Taco Bell. And you're like, damn, like, is my opponent eating Taco Bell right now? Like, probably the <laughs> fuck not. You know what I'm saying? What do you, what do you as soon as the weigh-in's over, in terms of refeeding and refueling, how do you go about that? Do you just say fuck it and just go crazy and eat, or is there a process for that as well? No, I have I have like a very uh, I got it down to a science now. It's all like trial and error, like figuring out what your body's like reacting to and stuff like that. So I have a gallon of water. I pour out about a quarter of it. Put like a thing of coconut water in, some honey, uh, some Himalayan pink salt. Stir it all up. It kind of tastes like ass, but it's at the time, you like you haven't drank in literally twenty four hours, so it's like amazing. And then um, a nice like sp- seltzer water, like not not like just a regular seltzer water to get your stomach going. And then um, eating what you ate through that whole camp, like what your body's used to. Don't want to you don't want to freaking load yourself up with cheeseburgers and pizza after you just made that weight because it's gonna make you feel like shit. Um, and then I I bounce all the way back up to eighty five as I'm stepping into the cage. I'm probably eighty five, and the night before I'm like seventy. Wow. So yeah, I think it's funny because I'm thinking about it from you talking about cutting weight and making weight for fighting. I'm thinking about you know I've done some photo shoots in the past after the gym, and there's a lot of similarities, a couple differences, but the whole water loading and sodium loading that's like a big thing. Like two weeks before. Because then your body is just holding all of that water mm-hmm. and your your body's getting used to holding all of that. And then you cut all that sodium. All the carbs are pretty much done. They kind of deplete as you go, I guess, gradually, especially for the bodybuilding, like, photo shoot. You would deplete, you know, as you go. And then that week, no sodium, no carbs, because you're just going to flush all that water out. You don't want anything that will hold the water. Because people who don't know, sodium, electrolyte makes you hold water. Um, and carbohydrates also make you hold water. And there's a whole science behind it because, like, the day before, like, a fitness photo shoot, you know, these bodybuilders go on stage and they don't want to have, they don't want to be holding any water. They still want to look full, though. So they they carb up the day before. And then what that does is pull the rest of the water, whatever they have have left, into the muscle. And it gives them that real grainy, like, aesthetic look, you know? So I'm just thinking about, but, like, the night before I do, like, a photo shoot for, like, and Corey does all the photos. It's funny. Like, he sees the meals. I go, like, I'll eat like fucking five Big Macs. I'll just go crazy, go carb up, soda, everything, and then I'll cut my water just that day. But it's interesting how dehydrated you get because you have to make that weight, and then you want to go in feeling okay the next day. Yeah, you know. But that's why I'm interested. To, like, it's it's it sounds way better doing it gradually and as a process as opposed to just after you weigh and just going crazy and eating like yeah. a crazy meal. Do you eat a lot of? Do you carb up that day before the fight after you yeah, weigh in? Yes, yeah. yes. That's when I'll eat a lot of the carbs, and then like when I wake up in the like morning and stuff like that, it's like fruits, honey. Honey's like a good quick carb to have, and it hits you like immediately. Like I don't know if you if I don't know if you drink pre workout. Oh, you drink bangs. I drink bangs and pre workout and Folgers for the soldiers, baby. I'm uh, any to any. That's right. I cover all forms of caffeine, baby. Do a little shot of honey. <laughs> Do a little shot of honey yeah. before you work out. And try, give it a try. Like, sometimes before practice when I'm, like, lo- like didn't need enough calories or didn't drink enough water or whatever, shot of honey, and then, like, I'm good. Yeah, a lot of people say it's really good natural energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honey. Like, the natural orga- carbs. Orga- organic honey is, like, really good. And, and what is your diet like in terms of outside of that, you know? So let's say leading up to a fight, right? We'll walk through it. Outside of the training camp weeks, leading up to a fight when you know you're ready to go, and I guess, how, how long are training camps usually? A month and a half. Okay, so like About, six weeks or so? Like yeah, six, six, to eight weeks. six to eight weeks is like a good camp. Before that, like leading up when you're just on maintenance, what is your diet like, like normally? How do, do you follow it very closely? Or are you a little bit more loose? How does it work? 
I'm a little bit more loose, but I'm still making sure I'm eat, I'm fueling my body. Like I'm still training twice a day. Like I'm not not training. So you're like people. Oh, like athletes under eat like crazy. Like they don't eat enough. Like the two thousand calorie diet. That's for like a person that like doesn't do anything. Like they just you know go to work whatever and like that's it. But if you're working out and you're burning calories, you need more than that. Like this may sound crazy, but like when I'm in fight camp, like training for a fight, like I'll probably hit like 4,000 calories in a day. But that's because I'm burning off like a shit ton. Like your body needs that to, you know, keep going or else it's going to, if you start to hit that Thursday and you start to feel like shit, well, that's probably because you're not eating enough. Um, but that, like I said, it's all trial and error. Everybody's bodies are different. Everybody reacts to food differently. Like some people, react really good with like steak and red meats like I do I love red meat I eat it a lot through and through um other people they don't they don't like it just depends what works for you honestly yeah I think trial and error is so underestimated because especially talking from the fitness standpoint there's so many people out there that are pushing like this is the way to do it and this is the way and so it's actually funny you talk about not eating enough Corey isn't he does like he runs insane amounts like he go he'll go five eight ten miles a day and he'll also lift. And so we were talking about his diet, and he was, like, telling me what he eats in a day, and we were figuring it out. And it was, like, 1,400 calories. And he's like, yeah, I was having trouble sleeping and all this. I'm like, well, you're not eating enough. Yeah. You know, and f- food is energy. For anybody who doesn't understand that, when you start to look at food as energy and fuel, there's, like, as soon as I started yeah. realizing that, I just start, I stopped eating all yeah. the shit, you know? And it's like, it's like you, you see a bag of Skittles, <coughs> you see a bag of Skittles and you see a nice steak. It's like, what's going to get me to have a better workout? <laughs> and if you pick the Skittles, you're a dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very clear once you start to learn about, about it, but what you were saying, the trial and error, and it's good to hear that from somebody who does as much activity and somebody who's training MMA and fighting actively because I think people get into the mindset of there's only one way to do this, and I think oh, yeah. there's always a base to start. You, you know, there's plenty of research out there, plenty of studies that show you where you can start. But then I think what everybody's got to realize is it's different for everybody. It's di- it's going to be different for you than it's different for me, for you. So you really have to do a trial and error and see what works. You know, not every MMA fighter is going to have that mixture that you talked about, the coconut water, the honey, and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, they're not all going to oh, do that. That might not work for them. When I was an amateur, I would freaking after I'd weighed in, I'd eat like a freaking pizza and like a burger. (laughs) And then thank God I just like started, like I had a nutritionist for a little bit and he was like, dude, you cannot do that. And I was like, what, why? Like what? Like in the Marine Corps, you eat freaking anything and you operate. So it does not matter. Like you could eat, you could be hammered at three in the morning. You're waking up at six in the morning and you're doing that five mile run. So that was kind of where my mindset was at. I was like, doesn't matter what you put in me. I'm going to freaking go through a wall anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then I started to like, listen, I was like, all right, like you go aside, like I'm going to listen. And then I started feeling so much better, like just eating the right things. And I was like, I feel like a superhuman. Like, this is crazy. Like all I had to do was stop eating pizza. Like, you know? <laughs> and people don't even realize it really is that simple where you could just start eating healthier choices. You don't even have to go all in. You yeah. can just start eating healthy and you'll feel, and especially, I mean, you're doing, like you said, you're training twice a day. Like imagine like training MMA twice a day and adding lifting into that and doing all these things, adding school, all that, like hearing it from you. Like it's very simple. Once you start adding, you know, healthier options into your diet, it will make a world of difference. Yes. I mean, you could give it a try if you want, but like what I do in the morning, I wake up in the morning, like when I'm in fight camp and I have like a cup of uh, organic beef bone broth have a cup of that instead of like a coffee or something. That's what I have. And then I have like six ounces of ground beef, whatever sauce you want on it, it doesn't matter. And then like two eggs. And I eat that for breakfast and it's not a lot, but dude, it, it's, it's the quality of the food you're putting in your body that makes you like, like I'll, I won't get hungry. Like I'm eating three meals, three basic meals a day, but they're all like loaded with a protein. Um, some carbs, depending if I'm cutting weight or not. And it's, like, good quality stuff, and I just, like, I don't ever have to stop and say, oh, man, I'm starving. Like, let me go grab something real quick. Like, I'm just good. Yeah, no, it's 100%, especially once you start the healthier options. People don't realize. People just sit on the other side of stuff. They point fingers, and they're like, no, 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 you don't need it. But once you start and you start to feel the difference, the whole not being hungry thing, 
people are eating snacks all you know what's so funny i always talk about in the nine to five you got the person that religiously every day will walk up you know get up from their desk at like 11 37 a.m walk to the kitchen they grab a pack of peanut butter a bag of cool ranch doritos and a can of coca-cola and then an hour late and uh, an hour later they're eating an italian sub diced in mayonnaise oil vinegar and stuff and it's like if you don't realize that that is what's making you a hungrier throughout the day and making you feel like shit you're a fool like that is what's doing it like skip that go to lunch don't even eat breakfast maybe if you want to fast and then eat a healthy meal that's high in protein and fats and you've set yourself up for the rest of the day yes. it's huge i mean people don't realize that and it's cool i mean especially like you said you had the nutritionist but once you learn that it's like you feel the difference oh yeah like now i like now i just i know a lot like i'm no nutritionist but i have a very good like idea and concept of like nutrition and I totally understand that. So, and I'm thankful I do because there's a lot of shit that makes so much more sense. Like trouble sleeping. It's probably because you're eating the wrong shit. And like, you know, waking up tired, eating the wrong shit. Like it all ties in together. Like waking up in the middle of the night, you're probably eating the wrong shit. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny because you'll start to see the results, you know, very quickly in terms of how you feel once you switch the diet. And yeah. I don't think... You know, people are hesitant to change, but that's just in anything in life. People are hesitant to change. You'll see it, too. Oh, 100%. Like you'll, you'll just see it in your body. Like, when I'm in camp mode, like, I see it immediate. Like, in a week, I see, like, all right, I got my six-pack, like, looking good. Like, getting cut up now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, right now, I'm a little fat, but. <laughs> well, I just still I just, training twice just, a day, yeah, you know? I, I just got done with the fight. I'm enjoying. <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying some freaking pizza and Taco Bell. I think As, I had. I think what? I had Taco Bell, like... Going off that, so you just... How long ago was your last fight? Like, almost a month. Almost a month ago. A little ago. less than a month. Yeah, a little less than a month. It was very recent, because obviously I still remember the night after when we were at Jay's. What, what are you doing now? Like, what is the plan next for your next fight? So, I'm looking to fight in December for CFFC in Atlantic City at the Hard Rock. I hope you can make it. Let's fucking go. There's no date yet on it, but um, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping it's for uh, a title, so... Really? The belt. I'm hoping so. How does that work we'll in see. terms? Is it the same way? Like it's all the top contenders fighting for the belt, like in the CFFC as yeah, it is in UFC? Yeah. Yes, 100%. Now, how, let's say you do fight for the title, let's say you win the title. Where does that put you in terms of getting a contract with the UFC? Oh, it'll definitely put me in the conversation for sure. It'll for sure put me in the conversation, especially if I get another finish. Um, it's something that I, I, like, I finish people. When I win, I finish people. As a pro, and even as an amateur, but as a pro, I've only not finished one kid that I beat. The others I submitted or knocked out. So it's – they they say this every time CFFC announces my fight. They are always like the always exciting Eric Nolan. Yeah, let's fucking <laughs> like, go. Yeah, I mean, I like I, for some reason, every time I fight, the guy I'm fighting is like on their shit, and it's just a crazy fight. It's a crazy experience to go to. If you don't know me, it's still a crazy thing to watch. But, like, if you know me, especially, like, you going there, like, you're just like, what the fuck? Like, I remember I was um, I was talking to this girl, and I brought her and her friends to my fight in AC. And then um, they were all like, this is my favorite sport now to watch, like, in person. It's just, there's nothing like it. Being in, being there... Hearing the punches and then the the reaction of people, like, it, it's crazy. Like, I remember the one I knocked the one kid out. Everybody was screaming. And the cage, like, it felt like it was shaking. Like, it, it was absolutely wild. There is no event like a live MMA fight. No. I mean, it is the energy is... Well, we were talking about it. We went to the Sterling and Cejudo fight. We were both at that fight. Yes. And, I mean, the energy that people bring it's to these crazy. fights. It's crazy. Yes. And, you know, it's... People have been doing that forever. It's it's UFC and MMA and all the, you know, Bellator and all. Mixed martial arts has really, professional mixed martial arts has really taken off over the last couple years. Yeah, it's starting to become very, very big. And and like you, you said before, Jersey is like a really big spot for yeah. him. I didn't even realize. Yes. You know, I know, of course, Frankie Edgar is a, lot a of people, fucking legend. So yes. we, we I got to watch him fight down in AC. Yeah. And that was the entire crowd. Frankie, yeah. Frank. It was Frankie's, nuts, you know. He's, he is the pioneer of Jersey. Jersey MMA. Same with my coach, Dante. Shout out, Dante. Yeah, what? where do you train? So I train at Dante Rivera's in uh, Freehold. 
Yeah, so that's where that's where I'm training con- consistently. We'll go to other gyms and spar a little bit here and there, but those are my coaches. Um, very loyal to them. I've, I'll, that's the only gym I've ever trained at. So, and I'm I pride myself on that. A lot of people like to hop around gyms and stuff. Like we are very, we are very like loyal oriented, homegrown Jersey boys like MMA team. Listen, loyalty in anything, especially MMA. Is yep. like we are, again. We're talking something we talk about. It's big loyalty to me is like almost the top top yeah. characteristic you would have. If you have loyalty, it's sh- and again you you start to once you take off, and I'm sure this has happened with you. Once you start winning fights and people catch on, you start to meet a lot more people. Same with just working in nightlife. You start to meet a lot of people, and what you'll find is that energy kind of leads to finding the right people, and it also help you find out who. The not so nice people are the you know the non loyal ones. You know you think a lot of people will be your friends and stuff like that. Nate Diaz in MMA has been somebody who's talked about loyalty since the beginning. Yes, and it's he has not left his squad of people. All his homies yeah. as he go like they they have not left each other's side since the beginning. Yeah, and yeah. he's coming. He's fighting Jake Paul soon. Yes, which is going to be interesting. Oh, but God, that loyalty is Jake you Paul. think about Nate Diaz. He's one of the bi- yeah <laughs> he's one of the biggest fighters in the world. Yes. And it was cool because I think everybody has, you know, what what's going to happen is going to happen. And when he fought McGregor that first time and he won, it was like destiny, you know. And Nate Diaz, he always talks about how, you know, he, he felt like he was not getting enough appreciation in the UFC and all that or not getting the recognition. And then he beats McGregor and it's like, holy shit, this guy, Nate Diaz. I mean, think about his brother is a legend of the sport. Nick yeah. Diaz is one of the greatest to ever do it. The whole GSP, like, saga when they were enemies and going at it and then fighting for the title. But... The loyalty that they have shown, I think, has attracted a lot of people to liking Nate Diaz. Yes. You know? And he's a hard nose. Like, he's like a hard guy, he, you know? He's another guy. Like like McGregor in one way, like Nate Diaz is in the same way. Like he is him. He's that. He's not trying to be anybody else. He's just who he is, and he doesn't have to act. And that's, that's something that I really like watching and fighting. Like I became a Nate Diaz fan after he beat McGregor. Not, I still, McGregor's my boy, and I always wanted McGregor to win. But I I appreciated Nate Diaz after the fact. I'm like, yeah, this guy's actually like pretty freaking real. Like, he's a real motherfucker. Yeah, it's cool when somebody has a moment like that that deserves it, especially like Nate Diaz. Like he yeah. deserved that, you know. And then you start to. What's cool about that is their story up to that point never wild, changed, yeah. and it's like you go back and you get to learn that story. And I think that's also the cool thing. I always talk about that, you know, on the podcast here. It's cool to sit down, especially like you and I. I just learned recently that you came to Reds and like, I've known that you've been fighting for a while and I didn't even know that. And then it's like, there's so much to fill in. And then when you get to a point where you almost have your day, that story hasn't changed and people can go back and see that story. And I love that about the whole podcast thing is like, we get to sit down, have this conversation and get to learn all about your life and your perspective of what you have gone through and how it made you who you are today. And it's something that we can always look back on now that yeah. we have it. You know, I think that's the cool thing about the era we live it, in. And it'll be cool too. Like in a couple of years, when I am in the UFC, we could come back and have this conversation again. And be then, fucking electric. Yeah. And then maybe a couple of years after that, I'll be coming home with the UFC strap. And Listen, that it factor is something that not everybody has. You have it, and you also have the fucking talent and the skill that I was saying before. That that's number one. You have them both. So, in my opinion. I don't see it going anywhere else but there. So let's fucking run the fucking show. Man. And then we're opening. Then we're opening it Nighttime up. at Reds. Nighttime at Reds. <laughs> yeah. We're freaking I'm, doing I'm it. I'm in for that. So dope. Well, where, where can they find you on socials and everything like that? So Instagram is Eric Nolan 12 um, Same with TikTok. Um, and I just started that new thing called Threads. Yep. I actually like that. I like Threads too. Yeah, I like it. I'm Instagram's version of Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love like it. it. It's kind of funny. I see so, some funny shit. Funny oh, shit like people it. post some. I've been I've been hitting one liners all day on that. I love it. I don't. I never really got on Twitter. I feel like Twitter was a crazy. It's a crazy app, you know. So it's like so. I hopped on Threads because I've always loved Instagram. I see some crazy shit on there as well. So dope, awesome. So December is the plan for the next fight. Yes, December. So and school in between starting this fall, right? Yep. That starts up. Going to be training. If you do end up booking it in December, when are you going to start locking in in terms of, like, the serious fighting or serious training for that fight? Oh, I'm locked in now. Yeah, already going still. <laughs> I'm still going hard. I'm still still training consistently, training hard. Just maybe not maybe not watching what I eat so much. 
devouring Taco Bell. <laughs> but, yeah. While you can. Yeah. No, While I'm you still, can. I'm already, I'm already, like, just driving here. I was playing a song, and I was just, like, thinking about, like, fighting again. Like, just, I kind of got an idea of who I'm going to be fighting, and I'm just, like, playing that in my head already. Like, it already started. There's no stopping it. Like The visualization is huge. Yeah. Well, dude, this was an awesome conversation. I knew from the beginning. I was like, yo, the energy is firing yeah. right now. You got the massive Red Bull. I had the fucking bang. We're dialed in. Caffeine is just pumping. The energy is flowing. Wish you the best of luck with everything. I'm definitely going to try to make the next fight. If it is in December, you know, I should have nothing going on. So I'll definitely, you know, try and get out there. And uh, obviously, I will see you uh, at the West Bar Post because I will be at DJ's until the summer ends. Hell yeah. Dope. Well, Love thanks again it. for coming on, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Absolutely. Really, Absolutely. Really great. I had a really great time. This was awesome. Talking. And then the follow-up is going to be even better, baby. Yep. UFC Gold. Book it. The Red Cask. Eric Nighttime Nolan. All fucking day. Let's go. Let's go. We're out. All fucking day. Let's go. That was fucking electric.